Welcome to John Bell House, where we're trying to answer the question, John Stuart Bell, was he Belfast's greatest scientist? And uh, John Bell looks like he's a little bit amused by this question. Uh, it's one which I'm not really sure that I'm qualified to answer because there are very many great scientists who came from Belfast. Uh, over the stained glass window to my left celebrates Lord Kelvin, the, who developed the theory of thermodynamics and uh, has the, the scale of temperature measurement named after him. Or if you look at the Ulster Bank 50 pound note, we celebrate Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who um, discovered pulsars and uh, is also a very uh, proficient scientist. Um, however, if we go far away from here to Geneva, to the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, CERN. We can see that all of the, all of the streets at CERN are named after very famous scientists. Um, so we have Madame Curie, the first woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize and the first person to be awarded two Nobel Prizes in different disciplines. She has a street named after her. Of course, there's Einstein, widely, perhaps the, the most famous of all, all scientists. And we have Root, John Bell. So John Bell has a place among these most eminent of scientists in, in the streets at CERN. Now, there are many scientists at CERN, Nobel Prize winners, and uh, not all of them have streets named after them. So what made John Bell so exceptional that, that he uh, qualified for this honor? Well, he was born in very humble circumstances in Belfast, just up the road from here in, in Tate's Avenue. In, in 1928 and uh, came to study in this building where we're now standing. Uh, at the time, it was the College of Technology in Belfast. And uh, I, I was interested in his experiences here, so I dug into the CERN archives uh, to try and find out uh, you know, what, what was John Bell's opinion of his time here. And uh, maybe we can play the first audio track. Prior to the universe, there was no inkling that you had that you were going to become a scientist or a mathematician or a physicist or something like that. That, that began to take shape in playing my secondary education, which was at the Belfast Technical High School, which was a department of the Technical College. So my secondary education was a little bit practically oriented. I did courses in bricklaying, carpentry, mm -hmm. and bookkeeping, although I enjoyed, I didn't enjoy the bookkeeping, but I enjoyed the carpentry. But during the, that three or four years, I certainly found that I was enjoying most the physics. So from, from John Bell's own words, it was when he came to this building in which we're now standing that he had the first inkling uh, that he wanted to follow uh, a career in physics. Uh, he studied some subjects that he liked and some that he didn't like, but one that appealed to him the most was physics. So the, the interviewer goes on. When you went to the technical school, was that some sorting out process? Were there possibilities to go to some other school and you somehow went to the technical high school because you showed technical aptitude? Or? No, I think it was because it was the least expensive. I sat many examinations for the more prestigious secondary schools, hoping for scholarships, but I didn't win any. So, John Bell was a very able and intelligent student, but uh, perhaps because of his social economic background, didn't have the same advantages as some of those who got places in the grammar schools. Although he did very well in the selection tests, um, he wasn't able to secure a place in a grammar school, and that's why he, he came to the technical college. But this gave him the start that he needed, and uh, in 1944, uh, he uh, got his matriculation re results, in these subjects, mathematics, English, French, physics, and mechanical drawing, which gave him the ability to, to go to Queen's University to study physics. Uh, initially, uh, he, he was too young to, to start the course, and there were some questions about finance. So he began uh, his career at Queen's as a technician in the physics laboratory, but had a lot of support from, from his professors. And after one year working as a technician, he was finally able to, to register as a student. 
Um, due to the support of his professors, he was able even to go to lectures during his time as a, as, as a technician and complete the first year exams. So that saved him a little bit of money for, for the rest of his uh, time as a student. So he, he graduated then in, in physics and then in mathematical physics and uh, ended up going in 1950 to, to Harwell, which was the UK's main nuclear research centre uh, near Oxford. So uh, I found on, um, on YouTube this delightful uh, video showing what life, a public information video which showed what life was like at, at Harwell at the time. And uh, it's kind of every stereotype that you can imagine about scientists. Everyone's wearing lab coats, they have test tubes, and uh, there's a, a very clipped uh, English accent uh, giving, explaining about the work of the scientists and, uh, and also, and, and here is the canteen where the physicists have lunch, just like ordinary people. Um, so this was the, the environment into which um, John Bell got, got his first job. John Bell's work at Harwell was on particle accelerators. So let's take a little bit of a step back in history to, to find out what a particle accelerator was. So if we go back to the early 1930s, the first particle accelerator was invented by Ernest Walton and John Cockcroft. Now, Ernest Walton was also from Ireland and in fact went to Methody in 1915. So uh, a few years after his, his career uh, in, in Northern Ireland, he, he also went and studied under Ernest Rutherford uh, in, in England. And uh, it seems to me that it's very important if you're going to design particle accelerators that your name should be Ernest. At least this seems to give you a, a, a head start. Um, so the, in, the, in the photo on the right, you can see the, this, this first machine which they invented. And uh, what this machine did was fired a beam of protons at a sheet of lithium. And uh, Ernest Walton sat in this little box and looked at a screen and could see scintillating patterns on the screen because alpha particles were coming off the, the sheet of lithium. And as the, as the media at the time reported, this meant that he had succeeded in splitting the atom. After the scientific success, uh, this knowledge crossed to the other side of the Atlantic where at Berkeley University, they carried on the development of new particle accelerators. Now, you, you may have seen the film Oppenheimer, and in this scene in the film, uh, set about 15 minutes into the film, set in the 1930s, Oppenheimer walks into the lab uh, and, and finds a man building a particle accelerator, whose name is, of course, Ernest. And uh, Ernest Lawrence, tells Oppenheimer, we're building a machine to accelerate electrons. So if we take a little bit of a look at this machine, you can see that there's um, a huge electromagnet over the top, and then a kind of cylindrical barrel in the middle where the electrons were, were accelerated. So the electrons were injected in, and uh, through the magnetic field, rather than going in a straight line, the, the trajectory of the electrons is bent into a circle. So it would start in the center, and as it as it gained energy with every rotation, it would, work, it would go in a spiral out to the outside of this drum and then be ejected out against uh, some fixed target. So this technology then crossed the Atlantic back to, uh, to Harwell, which is where John Bell started his career. And this, this machine, uh, I couldn't find a photo of it, but I found this very nice uh, drawing. Um, it's the the cyclotron pit, it says at the top. So this, this machine was a, a, a synchrocyclotron based on, on the model of what had been developed at, at Berkeley. And this was the machine that uh, John Bell was uh, working on or do, doing the mathematics um, to, to work out how, how part particles worked within this machine. So in he, he really became an expert on what's called the strong focusing system. This is how to control the, the particles, the movements of the particles within the accelerator. And at this time, uh, there was a European project to build a synchrocyclotron like the, like the one at Harwell and the one at Berkeley. In 1952, there was the first meeting of the Conseil Européen de Recherche Nucléaire, the European Council for, for Nuclear Research. And they made the decision at that meeting to build a European synchrocyclotron, which would be located in Geneva. So about six months after that, John Bell attended one of their technical meetings as a technical consultant on the design of the new accelerator. 
1953, he wrote this report, which is shown on, shown on the screen, the basic algebra of the strong focusing system. And all of the particle accelerators, uh, the, the designers at the time, said that this, this report was seminal and read by all the accelerator designers of the day. So that brings us to 1954 which uh, the, first, the first Earth was turned on the, on the CERN site. And uh, 1954, of course, was 70 years ago, which means that this year is the 70th anniversary of Godzilla. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to draw some parallels between, between this monster born of radioact radioactivity and uh, the creation of, of, of CERN in 1954. If you like, Godzilla is a Japanese creation, and Japan had, had experienced at first hand the horrors of having nuclear weapons deployed against them. And in 1954, uh, the Americans were doing their tests of the hydrogen bomb in Bikini Atoll. The, the Soviets were doing their nuclear tests. So it was a time of great fear about uh, nuclear war and, and the destructive power of, of atomic energy. So these, these same fears um, were considered by the CERN Council in terms of what they, what was the purpose of CERN going to be. And uh, in the CERN Convention, signed in 1954, um, they, they stated their, their aims. The first is that it would be a collaboration of European states. That is, these states, which had been at war with each other only nine years before, would now meet in peaceful scientific collaboration. And secondly, there would be no concern with work for military requirements. So that was explicitly excluded. There would be no weapons research at CERN, and that remains a fundamental principle of CERN to this day. And thirdly, that uh, the results of the, the research at CERN would be published or otherwise made generally available, that there would be, uh, CERN had a commitment to open science, and the, the results wouldn't be hidden away, they wouldn't be secretly used by governments, but it would be, be made public for the good of mankind. So in 1954, the first Earth was turned. Uh, I dug down into the CERN archives, and as far as I can make out, this is the first ever photographs taken of, of the CERN site. As you can see, it was just some fields on the edge of Geneva. Uh, it was farmland, and uh, they managed to obtain, obtain this site, and, and uh, under the watchful eye of the Geneva inspectors, brought their, brought their diggers and started digging their first tunnels. Uh, at the same time, the, the parts for the first machine, the CERN single cyclotron, arrived uh, on the back of a truck. Um, you can see it's, it's just like a gravel dirt road, uh, but they were bringing these highly, highly technical, highly advanced uh, machines to assemble on, on this new site. So in 1957, the CERN single cyclotron was, was completed, and this was the first particle accelerator to, to go into operation at CERN. Um, very shortly after this, in 1960, John Bell had the opportunity to, to leave Harwell and, and to come to CERN. Um, John and his wife Mary, who was also an accelerator physicist, um, were a little bit worried about the direction that research at Harwell was taking. Um, partly it was, it was becoming commercial into atomic energy. Partly Harwell had been used for weapons research, which didn't sit very well with them. Um, and they saw CERN as an opportunity to carry on in fundamental research and uh, in the development of new particle accelerators. So um, you'll see that almost every photo, photograph of, of John Bell in the archives has him standing in front of a blackboard with, with equations behind him. So John uh, was following his love, working in the theory department at CERN, whereas his, his wife Mary uh, continued to work in uh, accelerator design. So I could only find one photograph of, of Mary in the archives, but here she is um, at the inauguration of the CERN Super Proton Synchrotron. Yes, machines at CERN really have names like that. In, uh, in 1976, um, she was obviously one of the designers working on that machine, and she was, she was present at the inauguration. So in the early 1960s, um, John and Mary had the opportunity to, to take a sabbatical year in the USA. So it happened that uh, on, the, I remember this date very well because it's the date, the first episode of Doctor Who went out, the 23rd of November, 1963. They traveled to the USA and, and spent a year there. And uh, 
John then had the opportunity to look at some more uh, theoretical topics, not directly related to his CERN research. And he was very interested in the foundations of quantum theory. And in particular, one paper that had been published by Einstein some, some years before, which uh, the newspapers reported as Einstein attacking quantum theory, um, or saying that, that quantum theory was not a complete description of, of reality. The paper published by Einstein uh, had within it what came to be known as the, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. And the idea was basically this. Um, if you're familiar with the idea of Schrodinger's cat, I'm sure you've heard the analogy. There's a box and inside the box is a cat and there's some radioactive material inside the box which is going to kill the cat, but you don't know if the cat is alive or dead. The, the cat is in a, a quantum superposition of being both alive and dead at the same time. Until you make a measurement, you open the box, and then the quantum state of the cat collapses into either an alive cat or, or a dead cat. So Einstein's uh, problem was, was kind of related to this in a way. Um, if you imagine, instead of one box, there are two boxes which are at a distance from each other, and both boxes have a cat, uh, but the cats are in a state of quantum entanglement with each other. So they're both in a superposition of being alive and dead, but when you open one of the boxes, you discover that cat is alive, and simultaneously you know that the other cat is dead, or vice versa. And Einstein said, well, reality can't work like that because you can't communicate faster than the speed of light. And so it must be the case that there are some hidden variables. There's some, some hidden state that we don't know about and haven't fully explained yet and isn't explained by quantum mechanics, which explains how we know that the states of the two cats are entangled. So uh, Bell was very interested in this paradox. And uh, he, he said, well, what Einstein is saying is not really consistent with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And uh, so he brought forward this paper. I, I tried to read Bell's paper, but it has this nice introduction followed by four pages of dense algebra, so I couldn't really follow it. But um, his, his basic idea was, well, either Einstein is right or quantum mechanics is right. They can't both be right. And uh, he proposed a test whereby you could tell which was correct. So... Um, John Bell's paper was not uh, really re regarded very much for, for several years, and it was quite some years before it was really picked up and other physicists began, began looking at it. But eventually there was a lot of interest. And uh, in fact, uh, um, a French physicist started working out how to propose the test that, that uh, would later prove whether John Bell was right in, in, his, uh, in his theorem. Another contemporary of, of John Bell at, at CERN was a, an Austrian physicist known as Reinhold Bertelmann. And Bertelmann was very famous for always wearing odd colored socks. He started doing this as, as a student, as a kind of protest against, uh, against authority, but then he carried it on through, through his entire life and he was well known for it. So John Bell at a, a physics symposium was presenting a, a paper about uh, his, his theorem, and uh, he included in it a, a cartoon to try and explain this, this idea. So, uh, les chaussettes de Monsieur Bertelmann et la na nature de la réalité. So, the, Mr. Bertelmann's socks and the nature of reality. And he, he had this idea, well, if you see Mr. Bertelmann walking around a corner and uh, his one foot forward, and you can see that his sock is pink, you instantly know that his other sock is not pink. So he, he presented this talk at a symposium without having told Bertelmann that, that he was going to do so. So Bertelmann heard about it and then he called up Bell and said, what's this? What's this about my socks that you're presenting, presenting me uh, in public? And uh, John Bell's response was, I'm going to make your socks as famous as Schrodinger's cat. Um, so Bertelmann kind of liked this idea and uh, in Bertelmann's own uh, later uh, publication on this topic, he, he put his conclusion 
that uh, here, here you can see Einstein with Einstein's idea of spooky action at a distance. Was, this was how Einstein described this uh, quantum entanglement and this, this communication between separated quantum uh, uh, particles with uh, the, the, the spirit holding, holding the two um, different colored socks and coming out of a bottle of, of Bell's whiskey, which uh, John Bell didn't drink, by the way, but <laughs> Irish, Irish whiskey and, uh, and uh, John Bell's name. Um, but w eventually, as, as I said, uh, it was possible to create experiments to verify whether or not uh, John Bell's theorem was, was correct. And um, uh, a, a French physicist, Alain Aspect, um, devised, the, devised an experiment and, and proved that, in fact, the predictions of quantum mechanics are correct. And uh, even though it seems non-intuitive, reality is stranger than we thought, and, and John Bell was correct in, in his assertion. So in 2022, two years ago, Alain Aspe and, and his uh, collaborators, uh, John Clauser and Anton Zielinger, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for this work that they did, which established the violation of the Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. John Bell is honored in his hometown through the naming of this building in which we stand, and uh, nearby in Titanic Quarter, Bell's theorem crescent um, records his, his greatest theoretical achievement. Um, so the very last photograph that I could find in the archives of John Bell was in uh, 1989, where he was standing in one of the tunnels of the, the much larger particle uh, accelerator, the, uh, the large electron-positron collider, which exists in a tunnel um, 26 kilometers long. John Bell, unfortunately, passed away at the age of 62 um, in, in 1990. However, the work which he started continues. And uh, this, this machine in the tunnel where he now stands has since been replaced by a much larger machine, the Large Hadron Collider, a, a more powerful particle accelerator. Um, it's in 27 kilometers in circumference, in the tunnel 100 meters underground, the construction of this machine was overseen by another Irishman, a Queen's graduate, Steve Myers. Steve Myers uh, worked at CERN from the 1990s until the 2010s. Um, he oversaw the construction of two of CERN's large particle accelerators and then went on to work in uh, re research on medical accelerators, that is using particle accelerators to treat cancer and, and other conditions. In 2012, the Large Hadron Collider discovered the, the Higgs boson, which was the final missing piece in the jigsaw of the, the standard model of particle physics. This is one of the, the greatest scientific achievements of the, the 21st century. Finally, you, you also could design an experiment uh, to be tested at a particle accelerator. So CERN and DAISY, one of the other European laboratories, have an annual competition called Beamline for Schools. The deadline for this year's competition is 10th of April, 2024. If you don't make it for this year, there'll be another competition next year. You as a school team can think of an experiment that you would like to test in a particle accelerator. And if your experiment is chosen, then you can come to CERN or to DAISY and actually put your experiment to the test, working together with, with CERN scientists. So perhaps, perhaps one of you can, can come and be as, as great a particle physicist as John Stuart Bell. Thank you.